pleasure to introduce Professor Jennifer Rubenstein, who is Associate Professor of Politics at the University of Virginia. Uh, Professor Rubenstein is uh, the author of a recently published book, Between Samaritans and States, The Political Ethics of Humanitarian and International NGOs, uh, that just came out from Oxford University Press in 2015. Uh, she's currently working on two large-scale projects, one on emergency claim-making and the other on the politics of donating. And the title of her talk today is Between Samaritans and States, the Political Ethics of Humanitarian and International NGOs. So, uh, Thank you. I'm not going to bother with the microphone. Can everyone hear me fine? Yes, okay. Um, so thanks to Lenny and Carol for inviting me and to all of you for coming. Um, uh, I'm going to talk today about um, some things from my recent book, Between Samaritans and States, The Political Ethics of Humanitarian NGOs. So most of my talk is going to draw on the book itself, and in the last part I'm going to talk about some of the broader implications, um, which are things that I'm working on currently. Um, and the last part is going to be fairly sketchy, um, but I'm hoping to invite you to talk to me about some of those topics. That's my secret agenda. Okay. Um, so there are today tens of thousands of international, non-governmental humanitarian organizations, or humanitarian NGOs. And of these, I'm going to focus on a small but powerful subset. The large-scale, mainstream, Western-based humanitarian NGOs, uh, such as Oxfam Care, Doctors Without Borders, also known as MSF. So among these Western-based NGOs, these are the groups that raise the most money from the most donors, they aim to assist the most people, they have the highest profiles, and they most profoundly shape trends in the sector as a whole. So Michael Barnett refers to the six largest of these INGOs, CARE, Doctors Without Borders, or MSF, Save the Children, Oxfam, Catholic Relief Services, and World Vision as the Gang of Six. Um, so this is kind of where the action is, in a sense. Um, most of these INGOs were founded in the mid-1900s by small groups of dedicated activists undertaking a single activity. For example, Oxfam began as an effort by a small group of pacifists to send food to starving Greek children behind the Allied blockade during World War II. MSF was founded by a few doctors providing emergency medical care to civilians during the Biafran War. Today, however, these INGOs employ tens of thousands of individuals in dozens of countries, the vast majority of them hired locally, uh, in order to assist or try to assist millions of people. They also undertake a wide range of activities beyond humanitarian aid, including development aid, reconstruction, disaster prevention, peace building, livelihood support, advocacy, campaigning, and scientific research. So while they're a small subset of all INGOs, the INGOs that I'm going to talk about today are actually really diverse among themselves. Uh, some are secular, while others are religious. They rely to different degrees on governments for funding. They undertake different substantive activities. They orient themselves differently towards their donors and towards host governments. Um, finally, as one aid worker put it to me, they have different souls. Um, so in talking about these INGOs as a group, it's vital to keep this diversity in mind. Uh, the other thing that we have to keep in mind is that these organizations don't operate in a vacuum. They interact not only with the individual donors, host governments, and aid recipients, but also a welter of other entities. Corporate and governmental donors, foundations, for-profit humanitarian organizations, military and paramilitary organizations, UN agencies, Red Cross organizations, local NGOs, community-based organizations, religious groups, the media, host governments, and social movements, just to name a few. So even though I'm talking about these organizations, we can't forget that they're part of this much broader, messy picture. Um, so these are the INGOs that I'm going to be discussing. And today they tend to be perceived in two opposing ways by people in donor countries. And by the way, by donor countries, I mean countries that are primarily, but not exclusively, donors rather than recipients of aid. Many so-called donor countries, such as France and Japan, have been the recipients of humanitarian aid and vice versa. A lot of countries that receive humanitarian aid also give it. Um, but in any case, on the one hand, these INGOs in donor countries are sometimes perceived as heroes, moral saints, or do-gooding machines that reliably transform dollars into lives saved or suffering alleviated. Um, on the other hand, you see this a lot in TV shows like ER. They're sort of perceived in, per portrayed in this kind of saintly way. On the other hand, critics frequently describe these INGOs as culturally and politically obtuse, inefficient, unaccountable to their intended beneficiaries, blindly technocratic, tone deaf to how their actions are perceived by local people, beholden to their donors, insufficiently responsive to issues of structural and political injustice. Uh, critics also argue that INGOs undermine the accountability of host governments by providing services in their stead, 
provide cover for external governments to either engage in harmful political action or no political action, um, and that they benefit from the continuation of the problems they seek to address, and that they obscure, obscure the role of donor countries in creating these problems. So these criticisms have been elucidated in books with subtle titles like Famine Crimes, Condemned to Repeat, The Road to Hell, The Selfless Altruist, The Dark Side of Virtue, and Displacing Human Rights. Yet, with few exceptions, many of these really vocal critics of humanitarian INGOs don't actually, if you read them, want them to just close up shop and go away, at least not in the immediate future. Um, for example, in Displacing Human Rights, Adam Branch, which is one of the more, most vociferous of these books, Adam Branch argues that humanitarian organizations work hand-in-hand -hand with the Ugandan government to immiserate the Acholi people in northern Uganda, but even he ends up proposing reforms such as improved accountability rather than just dismantling humanitarian INGOs in their entirety. So on the one hand, humanitarian INGOs are clearly not moral saints or superheroes, um, but even their most serious critics don't think we should just get rid of them. So that leads to the question that I'm going to talk about today, which is how should we think about them? And I'm going to argue that we should view this set of large-scale, western-based, mainstream humanitarian INGOs as political actors that regularly face daunting ethical predicaments in which all available forces of action require moral compromise. And in studying these predicaments, the question we should ask isn't only, okay, what's the least bad option for them to for them to choose, but also what is the very fact that they face these predicaments, these situations in which all available options are bad, tell us about their promise and limitations as actors. Um, so the rest of my comments are going to proceed in four steps. First, I'm going to give you just some concrete examples of ethical predicaments that humanitarian INGOs have faced. Next, I'm going to describe some existing approaches to thinking about humanitarian INGO ethics and argue that they fall short in helping us to recognize these predicaments and understand what's at stake in them. I'm then going to present what I think is a better alternative, which I call, it's not very catchy, but I call pluralist, pluralist consequentialism. Finally, I'll consider some broader implications of the argument. Okay, so let me start with some examples. And I'll tell you about kind of four types of predicaments and then give you one or two examples of each of them. So our first predicament involves knowing but unintentional contribution to injustice. So um, in 1994, as I'm sure most of you know, the Tutsi-dominated Rwandan Patriotic Front routed the Hutu-dominated Rwandan Armed Forces, or FARC, to end the Rwandan genocide. Almost two million Hutus, including both civilians and ex-members of the FAR, streamed out of Rwanda and into camps in Burundi, Tanzania, and what was then Zaire. So the camps in Zaire, uh, this was true of all of them, but in particular, soon became highly militarized. And the putatively ex-FAR, seeking to regroup and rearm, stole vast quantities of aid intended for civilians. They also used the civilians in the camps to garner international sympathy and as human shields. Right, so they left Rwanda, and they were in these camps with all these civilians around them, right, who were drawing in all this aid. Several INGOs, including Oxfam Care and MSF, were in the camps, and they knew that all of this was happening. They therefore faced a kind of wrenching decision. Should they continue to provide water, medical care, and other services in the camps, knowing that in so doing, they were enabling the XFAR to gain strength, or should they withdraw, thereby depriving legitimate refuges, refugees of needed services. So while this example is extreme, humanitarian INGOs working in conflict settings regularly face ethical predicaments with roughly this structure. You can continue providing basic services to a large population, knowing that your presence and some of your resources are being redeployed for grossly unjust purposes, or you can withdraw and avoid this, but in so doing, remove basic services from people who need them. Okay. Um, so the next uh, a type of predicament that I'm going to talk about involves allocation of limited resources. And I'm going to give you two examples. In 2000, the town of Gulu in northwest Uganda was struck by an Ebola epidemic. Conventional wisdom at the time was that Ebola epidemics burn out on their own fairly quickly. But MSF, one of the few organizations that was providing kind of basic health services in the area, decided to divert resources away from these ba basic health programs that it was doing to address the epidemic. So one MSF employee defended this decision on the grounds that, quote, alleviation of suffering and dying in dignity was enormously important. We know we saved very few lives. But then another aid worker asked, 
how would you explain to a villager from the outskirts of Gulu the choice MSF made in addressing the problem of Ebola, but not the health problems in his village? The implication being that MSF would probably have saved more lives had it stuck to its basic health programs. Um, so that's one example of this resource allocation question. And here's another um, example, as described by uh, someone I interviewed, an MSF uh, worker named Kenny Buck. He says, okay, we treat tuberculosis in South Sudan. It is incredibly expensive. We fly in the doctors and the nurses. We fly in the labs. A reasonable person, thinking with a utilitarian mind, will say, why don't you do that when you're in Uganda? You're practically in the same area. You can treat these people for a tenth of the cost. You'd save ten times more lives with that amount of money. And then he goes on to say, well, could these people have been stuck in this war zone facing massacres and near genocide for 50 years? That's why we're working with them. So in both of these cases, one central question is, how much weight should INGOs put on simply saving as many lives as possible, or in technical terms, maximizing the number of quality-adjusted life years that they provide per dollar spent? And how much weight should they put on these other aims that are more difficult or even impossible to quantify, such as helping people die with dignity, expressing outrage, or standing in solidarity with the population? Okay, so that's another kind of uh, predicament they face. Next, we have two examples of an ethical predicament that often arises in the context of advocacy. Uh, not all humanitarian organizations engage in advocacy, but many of them do. So in 2010, um, uh, the INGO's Global Witness and Enough helped to write the text of the Conflict Minerals Provision, Section 1502 of the Dodd-Frank Bill of the U.S. Congress. And these INGOs, this actually ended up even being even more important, they helped to shape the lineup of speakers at a Security and Exchange Commission roundtable about how to implement this provision. So it sounds incredibly boring, but it was incredibly important. Um, Section 1502 was supposed to reduce the conflict in the DRC by requiring U.S.-based companies to show that the minerals they purchased from the DRC didn't come from conflict mining. But many Congolese experts and activists argued that the bill would both fail to accomplish these aims and further impoverish Congolese miners. Um, these experts and activists were largely excluded from deliberation about the bill, yet some of the outcomes they predicted appear to have come to pass. Likewise, in March 2011, Oxfam and three Ghanaian NGOs released a report they had jointly commissioned called Achieving a Shared Goal for Universal Healthcare in Ghana. You can see at the bottom, I, oh, you can't see. Okay, but I, this Oxfam and the name of the three Ghanaian NGOs is there. Okay, you can also take that word. Um, so, so Oxfam and the name of the three Ghanaian NGOs is there at the bottom, and they're all sort of an equally large font, kind of equally situated on the cover of the report. Um, uh, and so they, and they had jointly commissioned this report. And so the report asserted that the current health system in Ghana is unfair and inefficient, and that Ghana's national health insurance scheme should be dismantled and replaced with free and point of service health care for all, funded primarily by tax revenues. So this report generated a big controversy, both in Ghana and in international development circles. Ghana's National Health Insurance Authority, the main government agency that was criticized in the report, argued that the report was a sloppily researched effort by Oxfam to, quote, tarnish a homegrown African initiative. The World Bank then issued a report about the Ghana's healthcare system and have also referred to the report as Oxfam's report and Oxfam's critique. Thus, both the um, National Health Insurance uh, Agency in Ghana and the World Bank overlook the fact that all these other Ghanaian organizations were equally involved with Oxfam in creating the report. Um, so a central issue that's at stake in both of these examples is to what extent should INGOs engage in advocacy and other activities themselves and to what extent should they step back and try to support other of these potential, potentially superior advocates, such as Congolese and Ghanaian NGOs. Okay, and our final example involves the use of um, INGO's use of visual images. So on May 28, 2003, the British newspaper, The Daily Mail, published a photograph um, of the Irish rock musician Bob Geldof handing a baby, Mechanic Philippos, to the baby's mother, Ms. Nunesh Abraham, at the Yerba Therapeutic Eating Center near Awasa, Ethiopia. And so the photograph, you can't totally see it here, it kind of portrays Geldof as a sundap old savior, beneficently delivering the malnourished mechanic into the arms of his disconsolate mother. So this whole visit to Yerba had been arranged by Save the Children and UNICEF as part of a publicity tour meant to put Africa more squarely on the agenda of an upcoming G8 summit. And at the time of the visit, Save the Children had policies prohibiting the use of these kinds of images in their own 
materials. The Exe's children was willing to facilitate this dissemination of this, the creation and dissemination of this image in the newspaper. So as the program director for Save the Children UK and Addis Ababa put it, uh, the photograph is not an image we like. In fact, we try to avoid it as much as possible. You won't see any of that on our literature, but we do work with therapeutic food and feeding, and we do have children that look like that, and I tell you, it opens the, po the pockets, and that is the reality you are forced into. So this is just one example of a more general conflict INGOs face regarding their use of images. Do you use whatever images will raise the most money, or do you limit the images that you use, or the images that you help to create on ethical grounds, even if this means raising less money? So these are certainly not the only kinds of ethical predicaments that humanitarian organizations face, but I think they're among the most significant, and I think they're among the ones that sort of political theorists, political theory might have something to say about, and that's kind of why I focus on them. Okay. So with these examples in mind, let me now turn to some common approaches to conceptualizing humanitarian INGOs and show how they fall short in helping us to recognize and grapple with these sorts of ethical predicaments. In the book, I discuss um, eight of these approaches. Um, I'm not going to, I'm only going to talk about two of them, but I want to tell you what they are so that you can ask about them if you want to. Um, so just briefly, um, these are the humanitarian INGOs are and should be rescuers of the people they seek to assist equal partners with domestic NGOs or governments in the countries where they work, agents for their donors, and agents for their intended beneficiaries. A fifth conception, which is slightly different from the, I, from the idea that INGOs are agents for their intended beneficiaries, is the idea that they should be accountable to their intended beneficiaries. A sixth approach focuses on the traditional humanitarian principles of humani humanity, impartiality, and neutrality. And then two final approaches don't provide a springboard for positive accounts of humanitarian INGO ethics. Rather, they suggest that any such account is beside the point because INGOs are not significantly different from neo-colonial governments or multinational corporations in a bad way. So, I think that all of these approaches actually offer some insight into humanitarian INGOs or they raise important questions about them. I don't think we should dis dismiss them fully. Um, but they all fall short because they mischaracterize INGO's capacities, activities, relationships, or effects. So today I'm just going to give you uh, a taste of this argument by briefly mentioning a few problems with just the first two of these approaches. So first is the idea that INGOs are rescuers for the people they seek to assist. So some INGOs really actively present themselves in this way. For example, MSF ran an advertisement stating that the world is our emergency room. Yet yeah, conceptualizing INGOs as occupying the social role of rescuer um, is really deeply misleading. So rescue is short term, but humanitarian aid by INGOs is often long term, lasting years or even decades, as we saw in the example of the Rwandan camps in Zaire and, Ebo and the Ebola epidemic. As a result, INGOs develop relationships with the populations they seek to assist. So because it misdescribes, because it doesn't even recognize this kind of ongoing relationship, the rescuer conception provides no leverage for thinking about what its political or ethical implications might be. In addition, rescuers, as we typically think of them, just respond to emergencies that are out there. In contrast, humanitarian INGOs help to create um, our ideas about what is an emergency and what isn't an emergency. So again, thinking about them as rescuers provides no leverage, leverage on the kind of ethical and political dimensions of how they do that, for example, in their use of, um, through their use of indigents. Finally, the paradigmatic problem in rescue is that there are too many victims and not enough rescuers. We imagine like the rescuer coming and there's all these people drowning off of flight boats and there's too many victims and there's one rescuer. For humanitarian INGOs, that really is sometimes how it is. But in many cases, especially for high profile emergencies, there's too many NGOs. And there's it's what David Reed calls a humanitarian circus. And they're falling all over themselves and getting each other's way. And this also presents ethical issues that you can't even start to think about if you just think about them as the lone rescuer. Okay, uh, um, and there's lots of other problems that I'm not going to talk about now. Um, okay, so a second approach um, that I bet people here are likely to find much initially much more appealing. Um, oh wait, let me just say one more other thing about the rescuer lens. I think the good thing about it um, is that it does really powerfully capture the idea that unwanted early death is a really bad thing. And it raises the question of how humanitarian INGOs might incorporate this core humanitarian insight without casting themselves as rescuers. So how they can incorporate humanitarian norms without doing it in this kind of rescuer kind 
So the second approach is the idea that INGOs should strive to be equal partners with the domestic NGOs and governments with which they work. So this language of partnership is ubiquitous in the INGO sector. As one commentator put it, everybody wants to be a partner with everyone on everything, everywhere. And so, for example, as we saw, Oxfam and the Ghanaian NGOs presented themselves as equal partners in the, presenting this, this shared goal report. So if the rescuer conception is at some level appealing because it seems to embody humanitarian norms, equal partnership is appealing because it seems to embody egalitarian norms. But I still think there's a lot of problems with partnership. Um, one is that it doesn't address the underlying structural inequality that persists because domestic NGOs typically rely on INGO partners for funds. So in the Oxfam example, even though they presented the report as equally written by all of them, in fact, Oxfam paid for the whole report. The Ghanaian NGOs paid for part of rolling it out, but Oxfam really paid for the whole thing. Um, a second limitation is that equal partnership implies a particular kind of equality. Uh, a call equal partnership, equal participation by everyone who is able and willing to help achieve some goal. Right? We're all going to be equal partners because we're all going to help do it. Um, the equal partnership idea doesn't contemplate the possibility that perhaps a better interpretation of equality is having a say proportional to how much one's basic interests are affected. affected. So while equal partnership ca captures the importance of equality in general for humanitarian INGOs, the kind of equality that it instantiates has some real limitations. So in my book, I argue that while the rescue lens captures the importance of humanitarian norms but specifies them poorly, and the partnership lens captures the importance of egalitarian norms but specifies them poorly, the neo-colonialism lens captures the importance of justice-based norms but also specifies them poorly, or incompletely, I should say. And the agent for aid recipients conception captures the importance of, and the accountability conceptions capture the importance of democratic norms, but again, don't really specify them in an adequate way. Um, uh, and, and this is because the biggest characterize INGOs of activities, capacities, relationships, and effects. Okay. Um, so let me now turn to sketching what I think is a better approach. Rather than thinking of humanitarian INGOs as do-gooding machines, or on the road to hell, or in any of the eight ways um, that I just described, I think we should think of humanitarian INGOs as somewhat governmental, highly political, and often second best. So the first obvious implication of this claim is that we must conceive of humanitarian INGOs as political actors. And so any account of humanitarian INGO ethics must be an account of humanitarian INGO political ethics. Um, so now let me explain what I mean by each of these three, each of these three ideas. So, although they're ostensibly non-governmental, um, the INGOs that I'm talking about today engage in at least two specific kinds of governance. Uh, what I call conventional governance and global governance. INGOs engage in conventional governance when they undertake governance functions that are roughly analogous to those performed by conventional domestic governments. So the most obviously obvious example of this is acting as the sole or almost sole provider of basic goods and services to whole populations, for example, as INGOs did providing water and medical care in the Rwandan camps in Zaire. Um, another way that they engage in governance is shaping the rules of coercive institutions. For example, enough of global witnesses work on the Dog Frank bill. Um, and another way is making large-scale decisions about resource use that have public effects such as MSF's decision to shift resources from its basic health program to treating Ebola in Uganda. This sort of governance, what anthropologist James Ferguson calls a kind of government by NGOs, often in a humanitarian mode, is a common phenomenon. Uh, humanitarian INGOs engage in global governance insofar as they help to constitute what Michael Barnett calls the international humanitarian order which can itself be seen as a kind of a global governance institution. Right? This is a common use of the word governance, but it's a little looser than the kind of conventional government analogy. This international order manifests itself in both informal norms as well as a host of formal umbrella institutions and initiatives and rules, um, including the core humanitarian standard, which I'll come back to at the end of my talk. Okay. So, Humanitarian INGOs don't engage in these kinds of governance to an appreciable degree all the time. They do sometimes. But even when they don't, they're still highly political. Um, I think this is so even for INGOs that came to be neutral or to stay out of politics. So like governance, political is an incredibly vague term, uh, but I mean it here in two 
specific ways. First, most obviously, humanitarian INGOs frequently have political effects. For example, uh, the INGOs in the Rwandan camps inadvertently helped to strengthen the X-Bar. Second, INGOs exercise discursive power, that is, they help shape widely shared meanings and understandings in ways that have political effects, for example, through their deployment of images such as the photograph of Bethanus Abraham and Dalbach. So the third main feature of humanitarian INGOs that might account for their political ethics foregrounds is that they're often second best actors. And here, by second best, I don't mean that they're second best rather than third or seventh best, I just mean that they're less than first best. Um, and that there's other actors, such as local governments, domestic NGOs, and transnational social movements, that at least have the potential to perform whatever activities an NGO is performing, whether governance or something else, better. So, for example, we might say that Oxfam was a second best actor compared to the Ghanaian NGOs when it came to advocating about domestic health policy in Ghana, because the Ghanaian NGOs had more legitimacy. Uh, likewise, we might say that for the same reasons that the Congolese NGOs um, were, better at, were, were better advocates than um, a Nazi global witness when it came to the effects of uh, the likely effects of 16, Section 1502 of the Dodd Frank Bill. Um, uh, however, the INGOs in the Rwandan camps, I think, aren't really second best actors in any significant sense because there weren't other actors that you could point to in the wings who could have come in and done a better job in that situation. So before, I'm going to, in a minute, go back and tell you what I think these three ideas together can tell us about the ethical predicaments that I talked about in the beginning. But first I want to give you sort of a general picture of what they tell us about humanitarian INGO political ethics. So first, and this is leading up to the idea of pluralist consequentialism. Okay. So the more that INGOs engage in conventional governance activities, the more responsibility they have to focus on the overall effects or consequences of their actions. Right? And this is sort of a common idea when we think about domestic governance. And this is because conventional governments significantly affect the basic interests and shape the reasonable expectations of many people in a comprehensive and ongoing way. Of course, conventional governments don't only attend to consequences, but they do or should give them a lot of weight. And I think that humanitarian INGOs that engage in governance functions, conventional governance functions, should do the same thing for many, although not all, of the same reasons. So the fact, insofar as humanitarian INGOs engage in conventional governance, they have reason to attempt to consequences. But the fact that they engage in global governance are political and often second best suggests that this consequentialism must be pluralist in form. It can't focus narrowly on one kind of value. So putting these ideas together, I contend that INGOs should navigate the ethical predicaments they face in what I call a pluralist consequentialist mode. They should focus on outcomes and consequences, but in so doing, not limit themselves to one kind or source of value. So to kind of clarify this idea, um, I want to distinguish it from a couple of alternatives. Um, one is the idea uh, widespread in donor countries that what really matters about INGOs is their intentions. And I think proponents of this view don't think that consequences are irrelevant. Rather, they seem to assume that good consequences will just follow reliably from good intentions. It should be clear by now that I think this assumption is a destructive fantasy. INGOs work in situations that are far too political and conflictual, their knowledge of power far too limited for their intentions to be reliable predictors of their consequences. So pluralist consequentialism also differs from the idea that you might find completely um, counterintuitive, but that some aid workers really do sort of endorse that um, what matters about INGOs is the intrinsic value of their actions, apart from whatever effect those actions might have. So as one aid worker put it, I do not care if we can or cannot know that humanitarianism has improved the lives of others in need, I know that I must act. And this approach is often connect connected to the concept of the humanitarian imperative, or the idea that there's an obligation to provide aid wherever it is needed. Again, it should be clear from my examples, in particular the Rwandan camps in Zaire, I think that this sort of bias towards action doesn't sufficiently acknowledge that humanitarian aid can cause harm, contribute to injustice, or simply be completely ineffective and so a waste of money. Um, pluralist consequentialism also diverges from two other approaches um, that are themselves consequentialist in form, but are more monistic about sources of value. One is so-called political humanitarianism, which suggests that humanitarian aid should always be leveraged in the service of one or a few broader explicitly political aims, such as women's rights or democracy, 
The other is the idea defended by proponents of effective altruism. Have you guys heard of effective altruism? But okay, um, I might, we, can, we can talk about that too um, later if you want. Um, and their idea is that INGOs should maximize the number of quality adjusted life years or qualities that they provide per dollar spent. Could you say that again? Oh, quality adjusted life years? It's a measure of. No, I meant the whole sentence. Oh, so the, 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 what the effective altruists say is what aid organizations should be doing or what you should be doing when you're deciding who to donate to is pick the organization that maximizes the number of quality adjusted life years that okay. um, your every incremental dollar that you add provides. Um, and there, there's some debate about that measure, but it's a, it's a reasonable approximation of our view, right? Um, and so a lot of humanitarianism, a lot of humanitarian action is just completely um, uh, indefensible if you're an effective altruist. Um, so long as there's uh, there's other more cost-effective ways that you can be maximizing quality. Okay. Um, uh, and I think a big problem with effective altruism is measurement bias, right? They um, uh, there's a strong bias in favor of interventions that can be measured easily and cheaply, such as mosquito nets and deworming programs, and against more political activities such as develop democratic empowerment that can't. Um, so I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had about um, humanitarianism and effective altruism, and we can talk about that in the Q&A if anyone wants to. Um, so I now want to explain what conceiving of INGOs as somewhat governmental, highly political, and often second best tells us about the specific examples that I talked to you about earlier. And so to do this, I'm going to walk you through a table that's very daunting, but do not fear. You will understand it. OK. OK. Uh, OK. So uh, first, recall the INGOs in the Rwandan refugee camps in Zaire. Right, they had to decide whether to stay, continue providing aid, or withdraw to avoid empowering the XR. If we examine on my account, what are the most important features of that? Okay. Um, uh, one is that um, they engaged in conventional governance, um, and they weren't second best actors. So um, there weren't other first best actors to take place, and both of those are really good reasons for them to stay and continue providing aid. On the other hand, insofar as they had negative political effects in the form of contributing to injustice perpetrated primarily by others, they had reason to withdraw. Drawing on the literature on dirty hands, I call this the problem of spattered hands because it involves a situation in which doing what is best in consequentialist terms sometimes means contributing to injustice, albeit injustice perpetrated primarily by others. Right? So their hands aren't directly dirty, but they're spattered by their involvement with um, uh, them just actions of others. So I think conceptualizing situations like the Rwandan refugee camps in Zaire as spattered hands problems suggests that INGOs should continue to provide aid when the benefits of doing so outweigh the cost, even if this means contributing to injustice. So insofar as they engage in governance, they're not entitled to simply withdraw to keep their hands clean because they want to remain morally pure. But they should view their spattered hands as a moral sacrifice for which they owe some kind of public explanation. So the spattered hands framework leaves a lot open, and we can talk about what it leaves open in the Q&A if you want, but it does rule out several lines of argument that are often invoked in debates about these kinds of situations and were actually invoked in the debate about the um, Rwandan camps in Zaire. Um, and one of them is the argument that INGOs should simply do no harm, which would suggest that they should withdraw. Um, and the other is the argument that they have to continue providing aid regardless of its effects because that is their remit, and that is the intrinsic value of action argument. So let me turn now to uh, our two next examples involving resource allocation, right? The next two, okay. Um, so here, uh, the question, as you'll recall, is whether INGOs should try to save lives as cost-effectively as possible, or also pursue goals that are more difficult or impossible to measure, like helping people die with dignity in the Ebola example, or standing up to injustice in the Sudan versus Uganda example. And I call this the cost-effectiveness conundrum. And how should INGOs navigate this conundrum? Insofar as their decisions about resource use function as a form of conventional governance, they must, again, attend to the overall consequences of their activities. But insofar as their decisions function as a form of global governance or discursive power, and insofar as they are second best actors, the consequences that they have can and should promote are, again, diverse. Too much emphasis on cost effectiveness narrowly construed underestimates the degree to which INGOs can function as expressive political actors that take stands 
in order to ignite outrage and pressure first press actors to fulfill their responsibilities. So if you think of them only as engaging in this conventional service provision kind of governance, you say, okay, go to Uganda, you'll provide more, you'll save more lives. And that underestimates the degree to which they can have some kind of powerful, more discursive political effect by staying in South Sudan and kind of taking a stand. Um, conversely, too much emphasis on INGOs' expressive aspects underestimates their conventional governance role and their responsibilities for consequence, consequences that this role generates. So I propose that INGOs adopt what I call an ethics of resistance as a form of political judgment that acknowledges the pull of both of these sources of responsibility. And this ethics of resistance can be distinguished, again, from other allocative principles, including the familiar humanitarian mantra of aid based on need alone, the effective altruist idea of maximizing qualities, and um, what MSF calls the ethics of refusal, which on one plausible reading argues against putting any weight at all on cost effectiveness. Okay. Third, ethical predicament, right? Enough of a witness, the, the advocacy stuff. Okay. Um, so the examples here, enough of a witness on Dodd-Frank and Oxfam on healthcare in Ghana. So here the question is, okay, to what extent you're an, an INGO, you want to achieve a particular substantive policy outcome. To what extent do you focus on just pursuing that outcome through advocacy? And to what extent should you step back and support or even pressure other first best actors um, like the Ghanaian and the um, Pakalese NGOs um, to take the lead. And I call this the quandary of the second best. Um, so if you view INGO advocacy as a form of unelected representation, as many political theorists do, or if you view it as partnership, as INGOs often do, this whole quandary is obscured um, because these conceptualizations suggest that INGOs should strive to be good representatives or strive to be equal partners. In contrast, the quandary of the second best foregrounds the possibility that INGOs should step back and let others take over, or as what um, Ghanaian uh, aid worker described to me as lead from behind. Um, uh, so rather than representation or partnership, this per perspective suggests that we view INGO advocacy as the use of power. And in normatively evaluating INGO advocacy, we should ask how well INGO advocates avoid misusing their power. Um, and in the book, I argue that this perspective helps us to see that while Global Witness and Enough clearly misused their power, Oxfam did too, although in a much subtler way. Okay, finally we turn to the actual predicaments involving images and the photograph of Bob Geldorf and Bezanish Abraham in the Daily Mirror. At issue here, and that's the one that you can see, right? Um, um, at issue here is how INGO should deal with the ethical predicaments associated with their portrayal-related practices. So at first blush, it looks like this is just a straight-up dilemma of need versus dignity, and that's in fact how Oxfam described it in a pamphlet they made for their photographers. Um, uh, it seems that this dilemma pertains solely to images in INGO's own materials, um, like the Save the Children guy from Addis Ababa talked about it, and that the appropriate response to this dilemma is to develop criteria for distinguishing ethical images to which we're going to give a thumbs up from unethical images to which we're going to give a thumbs down, and that these criteria should take the form of guidelines, rules, or codes of conduct. Once we foreground the idea that INGO's portrayal-related practices function as a form of discursive power, that they help to shape shared meanings, and that they have other political effects, I think it becomes apparent that all four of these assumptions are mistaken. Rather than a dilemma of need versus dignity, INGOs face a trade-off between raising money, utilizing appeals to moral feelings on the one hand, and avoiding a whole array of bad outcomes, um, only some of which involve dignity on the other hand. And I call this, you can't see it, but the moral motivation trade-off. And so this trade-off in the first place extends to all of INGOs for care related activities. You're not off the hook by having the image in the newspaper rather than in your own materials. Um, uh, uh, it uh, includes, uh, right, um, uh, or requires treating INGOs portrayal related practices holistically as opposed to giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down to individual images. And it requires not only rules of conduct but also creative practices. These practices include, include engaging in what I call critical visual rhetoric by using potentially objectionable images to grab viewers' attention and draw them into a more nuanced understanding of these issues. So here um, are some stills from a video produced by MSF that I think functions effectively as a piece of visual rhetoric. And you can see that it starts with kind of familiar famine iconography at the beginning, right? Malnourished kids, crowds of women standing in line. Um, and then by the time you get to the end, 
um, it begins to portray the main subject, Natasha, as a fully human individual with her own inner life. And you hear the audio um, that comes across even more powerfully. So to summarize, if we conceptualize humanitarian INGOs as somewhat governmental, highly political, and often second best, uh, right? Um, we can understand the specific examples that I have discussed um, and other similar cases as problems of spattered hands, cost effectiveness conundrums, quantities of the second best, and more motivation trade offs. And we can see that INGOs that wish to enact humanitarian, egalitarian, justice based, and democratic norms should often navigate these predicaments in a pluralist, consequentialist mode, which means sometimes allowing their hands to be spattered, enacting an ethic of resistance, not misusing their power, and engaging in critical visual rhetoric. All right, so I want to be very clear about something, because there's a lot of boxes here in categories. Um, this approach to humanitarian and INGO political ethics is intended to enhance, not replace, all things considered practical judgments about specific situations. It's a tool for uh, uh, contextual deliberation, not a, a replacement for it. Um, by acknowledging that INGOs regularly face ethical predicaments in which they have no good options, it's also intended to help us move from this narrow ethical question of what should a given NGO do in a given situation toward the broader, more political question of what the very existence of these predicaments tells us about the promise and limitations of INGOs as political actors. And we can talk about that more in the Q&A if you want. Okay. Uh, Before concluding, I'm going to briefly discuss, I'm actually just going to talk about two of the broader implications of my argument. I'm going to stick, skip the stuff about the core humanitarian standard. Um, if you want to talk about that in the Q&A, we can. Um, but I'm going to turn to um, uh, the implications of this argument for donors, INGOs, for individuals like you and I who are thinking, oh my gosh, now what should I do? Um, if INGOs are political actors that engage in governance, as I argue, rather than do-gooding machines, then donating to them is more like donating to a candidate for elected office than it is like putting money in a do gooding machine. Because donors to INGOs are not directly affected by what those INGOs do, while aid recipients who are directly affected by NGOs have no real way of holding them accountable, donating to INGOs, if we push this analogy even further, is somewhat akin to donating to an unelected political official in another country, albeit an official who is well meaning and often does considerable good. So what does this rather disturbing analogy suggest? First, uh, the, just the mere idea that aid organizations are political means that donors shouldn't be surprised when aid has negative effects. Viewing aid organizations as political then thus help to avoid what I call the moral whiplash that you might have experienced maybe when you were 13, um, which are sophisticated people, um, that ensues when you start out thinking that aid organizations are do-gooding machines and then, oh my god, they're having these negative effects, this is terrible. Um, and that kind of whiplash, I think, is dangerous, among other reasons, because it can lead to cynicism and resentment. Uh, moreover, donors who accept my account on humanitarian and geopolitical ethics um, uh, should seek to fund aid organizations that are, at the very least, attentive to these predicaments and transparent about how they navigate them. As of now, this is a pretty high epistemic burden on donors. It would be really hard to do this, given the information that you have available. Um, and I think this suggests the need for more mediating organizations that analyze and can critique humanitarian INGOs. I mean, you think right now about how much information, for better or worse, you have about candidates for president, right? Um, the kind of information you have about INGOs is orders of magnitude less um, expansive, right? Um, so I think this suggests the need, well, possible need for more new kinds of organizations. It also suggests that some forms of donating, such as donations to athons, donations as gifts, and donations in honor of people who have died might be worrisome insofar as they dissuade uh, the kind of active political engagement on the part of donors that, um, that, I'm, that I'm describing, right? If you donate money to your cousin's bowl of thought, you're unlikely to then go back and hold that aid organization accountable. Um, the third broader implication of my argument involves what we might call the politics of emergency claim making. This is a politics centered around different actors making and not making, accepting, ignoring, or rejecting claims that particular situations are and are not emergencies. Humanitarian INGOs are central actors in this politics. They traffic heavily in emergency claim making. Yet emergency claim making, as my account here sort of implies, can be really detrimental. 
It can exacerbate a paternalistic attitude on the part of outsiders who think of themselves as rescuers. It fosters the sense that normal rules, including especially rules related to democratic procedure, don't apply. It allocates resources based on questionable criteria, such as how vivid or dramatic the situation is. But at the same time, emergency claims are really powerful. They're really motivating, especially to outsiders. They can create solidarity, solidarity at least temporarily, across difference. So one thing that I'm thinking about in my current work is, OK, what are some possible functional alternatives to a politics of emergency claim making, alternatives that avoid all these limitations or retain some of its, some of its power? Um, so just in conclusion, I've argued that humanitarian INGOs are sometimes governmental, highly political, um, and often second best. Conceptualizing them in this way doesn't offer definitive answers. It doesn't replace contextual uh, practical judgments. But I do think it offers a promising basis for understanding the political and ethical dimensions of the predicaments that humanitarian INGOs face, thinking sensitively about better and worse ways for them to navigate these predicaments, and evaluating humanitarian INGOs as actors in light of these predicaments. And all of this, in turn, helps us to notice and support the valuable work that INGOs do, criticize them and look for alternatives when they fall short, and keep in mind the much bigger picture of which they and we are a part. Thank you for a very um, comprehensive account. Uh, I just have a couple of questions about not understanding some of the things that are up there. And also, um, to what extent this is specific to INGOs instead of NGOs in general. Um, but uh, one thing you don't mention, because you talk about them as often being in a place for years, and that therefore they they function as a kind of governmental body, is that one of the problems is that they're often there and then out, in and out, just the opposite of being there for years. And that sort of problem of international NGOs doesn't um, come up in your account of these sort of political issues. Uh, the, the substantive, I mean, the, um, the question about misusing their power, I think that's an important concern. But how useful is that as a uh, conceptualization when each will use their own understanding of when they are and are not using their, misusing their power? And to be, for them to be a wit, I, I assume this is for them to be understanding of what they should and should not do. But how is this going to help them when they will, you know, define it in a way that's convenient for them? So, um, and then finally, the question, I just don't understand what the ethics of resistance is. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take those in um, neither in chronological or in Jackson chronological order. Okay. Um, just quickly, the misuse of power in the book, I actually specify kind of four kinds of misuse of power. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to remember them all. Um, one is simply just sort of causing harm. Um, one is domination. Oh, um, okay, so you spill it out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and the, the most maybe controversial or subtle one is kind of about exploitation or, or what I call lowballing, like making an offer that um, NGOs, domestic NGOs, will only accept because of the unjust situation that they find themselves in. So, you know, potentially the Ghanaian NGOs wouldn't have agreed to this. You know, situation with um, Oxfam had they had money to sort of do all of this themselves, right? And that's a sort of a very subtle question that should Oxfam have taken advantage of that situation or should they have made the kind of offer that the Ghanaian NGOs would have accepted under more just background conditions? Um, can I try to go on? Sure. Okay. Um, but I totally agree with you. Misuse of power is extremely big. And in the book, I'm much more yeah. precise about what that means. Um, but I also think that even. I watched, even though in the book I am very specific about it, I actually think that thinking about it as the use of power rather than um, representation or partnership does actually shift the conversation. And I would be very open to having more conversation. I mean, part of what I want to do is open up a conversation about what are other ways of misusing power, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm okay with that sort of being a conversation starter um, via that sort of shift in perspective. Um, okay. Um, uh, 
INGOs versus NGOs, like domestic NGOs. I think um, the reason, it's funny, when I talk to aid practitioners, they sometimes say, how can you, we're so diverse, how can you talk about, you know, this, you know, INGOs all, you know, in one category, and then when I talk to people who aren't aid practitioners, they say, oh, the group of organizations you're studying is so narrow. Um, but to answer your question, um, because they're international, they have a very different sort of set of challenges, and they're working across borders vis-a-vis -vis their relationship to the state. Um, is one issue. And because they are based in Western countries, all the issues involving sort of the kind of colonial resonances of what they're doing, their kind of imprecation and kind of local internationalist politics comes up in a way that it doesn't for domestic NGOs. Which isn't to say that some of this stuff isn't also relevant to domestic NGOs, but I'm kind of remaining agnostic about, about that. Um, that it seems to me that some of it might extend to domestic NGOs, but um, some of it clearly doesn't. Um, okay, um, there's sometimes in and out. By that, do you mean just because of the whims of their donors? Yeah, yeah, it becomes, you know, this is the trend. Everyone's paying attention to this today. Tomorrow, they're paying attention oh, yeah, to something yeah, else. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the things that um, I talk about in the book is the way that how what's um, the right thing for one aid organization to do will often depend on what other aid organizations do, right. and there are like lots of sort of coordination issues that come up with that. So um, in Rwanda, there was a possibility, and in fact, this did happen for a whole bunch of NGOs to team up and to say to um, you know the XFAR, look, if you don't start behaving, we're all going to withdraw, and that's going to look really bad for you, and you're not going to get the steal from us anymore, basically. Um, and that did actually sort of have some have some kind of kind of effect, but um, insofar as it kind of disrupts kind of basic service provision that people rely on, then you know my argument would be that's sort of another reason for them to, to stay. But the kind of the the humanitarian service flitting from one hotspot to another um, is a huge problem, and it, it's the, the underlying structural fact that these organizations are relying for money and power on one set of people. From one set of people. Well, where does that figure in the kind of injustices that or concerns that you should have at the end? You know, on the right hand column. How is that considered? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not, I'm trying to think. Let's see. Um, I mean, I'm not sort of claiming to kind of be sort of um, comprehensive, but in the the point about um, governance, I guess, would be one place where it's an argument about why they should stay. Um, the argument about um, not going into a place where there already are too many organizations working um, would be a kind of a resource allocation mm -hmm. argument, I think. Um, but um, but I think you're right that it's not kind of, I mean, that, that issue, quite frankly, has been, since David Reeves 2000, Humanitarian right. Circus article has, has sort of been addressed a lot, so it wasn't actually oh, one of my main focuses. But but you're right that it doesn't play a central role here. Um, okay, um, ethics. So I someone said okay, and then the last question was about the ethics of resistance. So basically, I describe it as a kind of practical judgment, and the reason is that it's. Um, not a directive about what to do, it's a directive about how to feel pulled between and recognize the force of two kinds of conflicting um, imperatives or considerations. And one is, I call it the ethics of resistance because on the one hand, it's what MSF calls the ethics of refusal. And on some accounts of the ethics of refusal, there's kind of various versions of this, but on the most extreme version of it, um, you provide a small amount of, uh, you provide very high quality aid to a small number of people. And at some level, the argument is that this will um, have a kind of advocacy effect and show, for example, that it's possible to provide this kind of aid in a resource poor setting. I'm like, we're gonna provide really good TB treatment, right, that other people say can't be provided, just to a small number of people, and we're gonna show up the government and show that this can be done. Um, but they sometimes, on some, on some defenses of the ethics of refusal, um, it, it doesn't matter if the advocacy component actually works. We are just going to refuse to be hemmed in by the kind of logic of efficiency, and we're going to just stand strong, and we're going to just refuse to acquiesce to the sort of like low-level healthcare that other people say is all the people deserve. Um, 
And I think the problem with that in some situations is it doesn't take seriously enough the fact that they've already started to engage in these conventional governance roles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that once you're doing that, it's not, um, doesn't pay enough attention to consequences to just sort of stand and say, you know, we're going to do this thing on principle. Um, and then on the other hand is this like super cost effectiveness, effective altruism kind of, kind of position, right? Um, and the more if they're engaged in conventional governance, the more I think that kind of with logic of sort of maximizing immediate effects makes sense. Um, and the more they're not, the more defensible the sort of um, uh, more symbolic politics is. Um, and the idea of the ethics of resistance is simply to say that I'm not going to sit here and tell you in advance that one of those is better than the other, but that the right way to sort of think practically about this is to recognize the force of both of those. Mm -hmm. That was a long answer, but that's the idea, right? Um, and it's not satisfying if what you want is an algorithm for deciding what to do, um, but I think it's kind of the best that I personally as a political theorist could do in sort of like characterizing the force of what seem to be the various political and ethical considerations at stake. Okay, shorter answers from now on. Uh, first of all, I want to sort of congratulate you on this uh, really uh, interesting interpretation of all the dimensions of ING and work. I think that you could you know, package this and take it on the road and produce a course that would be taught to everybody who works for NSF and Alex Well, I've talked, I can tell you about talking to him about it, but anyway, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Um, but th there's, there's this one thing that um, I wonder about, which is, of course, unfair to ask, because uh, it's not something that's within the framework of uh, your analysis. But uh, humanitarian crises, uh, humanitarian circumstances, are residual effects of larger political conflicts, generally speaking. But you don't mention that. You don't mention how this intersects with those larger political conflicts. And so you talk about this as being a political, political ethics, but in fact you don't engage in the issues that might be uh, filtering in to the humanitarian activity, whether it be, uh, uh, let's say I'm Ted Cruz, you know, they are uh, breeding grounds for terrorists, uh, you know, they are uh, fomenting a flood of refugees, there are... Uh, who's the, who's or, they, who's they? The uh, humanitarian camps, oh, right, uh, humanitarian right, right, right. circumstances right, right. in which the only because because the agencies can only work there by virtue of being seen as a political. Okay, but obviously they're there because of political conflict of a more serious kind, and I wonder. Um, and so there's going to be this not so much an interface but an inter relationship between those political conflicts in whatever framework you provide here. And I wonder uh, what you make of this. In other words, is this a dependent analysis which really has will get thrown out the window in any actual humanitarian situation because of the larger issues and uh, more and better funded issues uh, that inform the actions of governments? Or is it something that really can stand up uh, to those conflicts because of the space that humanitarian agencies have etched out for themselves in the contemporary world? Uh, thanks. Um, so often um, yeah, sort of political theorists and practical ethicists think of themselves as engaged in these different projects, right? And the problem with kind of practical ethics is that it takes too much of the world as given, right? So all of this politics happened, and here I am kind of at the tail end of it, sort of rearranging the ships on the Titanic built by yeah, sort of the ship. Ted, Ted Cruz and others. Um, uh, but I think that the reasons, in two respects, the reasons why humanitarian organizations face the ethical predicaments that they face is because of political constraint. And you can only understand, and you can work backwards from our sense of them. And so, and the other thing that sort of shapes their 
these ethical predicaments is the, is the prior ethical commitments that you have. So if you weren't constrained by politics, none of this would come up. And if you didn't have sort of pre-existing kind of ethical commitments, none of this stuff would come up. So, and so these, you, I, what I'm, part of what I'm trying to do when I talk about sort of um, working backwards from ethics to politics is seeing that the reason why these organizations are in the situation that they're in is because of the political constraints that are around them and that part of the problem, another part of the ethical constraint that they face is they see themselves as feeding back into this, right? So I was just um, having coffee, I was like literally before I came here with um, a, a, a guy at MSF and he was talking about how they're in the, um, they just pulled out of the refugee camps or the camps in Greece because what had been sort of, you know, humanitarian centers were turning into detention centers, and they at some point felt that they couldn't be a part of that. And so that's just an example of how the politics are creating these ethical situations, and we can recognize what's salient about the politics in some ways by seeing, okay, what are, what are those, those kinds of ethical considerations? So um, I actually really do want to, um, I guess in my broader thinking about the relationship between political theory and practical ethics, maybe more than is, um, in the book, sort of think about these projects as mutually informing each other. That's, I mean, that's one of the places where I'm, where I'm looking to go next. Um, I, have a, I have two questions. One actually relates to that one, and that's the idea of the connection between um, counterinsurgency efforts and Department of Defense initiatives and um, humanitarian work, and I'm thinking specifically about like RFPs that will arise calling for a particular project that's humanitarian and everyone will bid for it, but it's put out by like DOD or Homeland Security. And so how that- And private it, companies also. And private companies, companies yeah. right. Yeah. And so how that, um, if at all, impacts the, um, your framework of pluralist consequentialism, um, and particularly with, with regards to um, transparency and also the idea that it's never really an NGO just as its own, an NGO as its own actor. So kind of what that looks like. And then I had another question about. Um, I well, what do you mean? It's never an NGO as its own actor. Alone, alone, alone. It, it, it's always you know, and bring it, like in, that its donors are also to some extent complicit in what it's doing, or that it's acting with lots of other actors, sort of on the political. Um, we're the first. Okay. Just that that there was like if you're responding to a call in the kind of you know um, humanitarian marketplace mm -hmm. um, put out by a particularly the right government. There's going to be, you know, the, impl the, the implication and the, and the connection there. And the, and the other thing I'm interested in is how um, how moral predicaments um, can be addressed through the um, the framework of pluralist consequentialism, um, thinking not about um, an acute crisis, but um, in terms of the way that economies are impacted by the long-term presence of the NGO, so I'm thinking about um, you know like local workforces that are hired to do um, you know house housework and cooking and things like that, and sex economies and things like that. That's implicated. Um, okay. Um, so some NGOs just won't take funding right from the USAID, not to mention even sort of military organizations. Um, and what my sort of framework suggests for those that do is, you know, it's it's pretty easy, I think, from a distance to say, oh my God, don't take that money. Like you're, you know, you that's contaminated money. And, um, but you know, after having talked to a lot of aid workers, I I kind of I understand the sort of blindness is involved in this too. I kind of take seriously um, that if if you think you're going to be saving people's lives, that that's a real thing, and you know the the you know horrible political implications of sort of you know participating in these you know larger scale political you know oppressive political you know, murderous political practices are bad too. But I've been sort of chastened a little bit in my in my in my thinking about that. And so you know the idea of um, taking seriously both the sort of basic you know, service provision that you're able to provide, but also take fully taking seriously, this is what I mean by the pluralist part, you know, the way that you're contributing to these political dynamics um, is important. And it's it's really hard because what you see, what's the counterfactual? Some other organization is gonna do this. You know, if you go too far down that road, then you'll do anything because there'll always be another organization that's gonna, that's gonna 
that's going to do it. But but you do need to think about what that that contractual is. Um, you know, my my intuition is that we aid organizations probably tend to underestimate the negative effects of taking those kinds of contracts. But I'm not going to sit here and make a sort of overarching argument that it's always the wrong thing to do. But I think you know one thing we can do is think about okay, what are the systematic biases that are likely to be built into the way that sort of systems are organized, the way that people who make decisions, the kind of information that they have, the kind of experiences they have, and try to sort of think about it in that way. Like if you're coming straight from the field where you've been using money to provide aid to people, you might sort of have some kinds of biases that you wouldn't if you're sort of involved in ongoing conversations with, with other people. So I, I think that's kind of one procedural way to think about it. How can we set up decision-making and practical judgment-making situations so that they don't have sort of obvious kinds of biases about this kind of situation. Um, the moral predicaments address thinking about the sort of ongoing, so there's been so much written, right, about the ongoing distorting effects on economies of aid organizations, right? You bring in a bunch of money, you bring in a bunch of rich people, and they're, you know, they're renting all the houses, and they're taking up all the gasoline, and they're buying all the food, and they're employing all the smart people, and, and you know, this really can be, um, Destructive. I haven't focused, didn't focus on that much again. Like Mary Anderson's "Do No Harm" stuff um, was sort of one of the first things to kind of sort of emphasize um, all of that. One thing that um, it's only tangentially related, but I think it's so interesting, and I want somebody to work on it, is in the issue of um, how you structure pay for domestic and, and um, expatriate um, staff is really important and interesting and hard, and how you deal with transparency about that about that issue, right? Expatriates who are gonna maybe go home and need more money because of you know the economies where they live, but they're doing very similar jobs to domestic people who are under in some cases even more at risk for what they're doing and you know how do you do that and how do you be transparent about it? Somebody should should work on that more. Okay. Um, uh, but yeah, but it, but in terms of how it sort of fits into the broader framework, it's again like thinking about the sort of broader consequences of what you're doing. Um, a big Factor that I didn't talk about here, but I mentioned in my book, and how you're going to sort of come out on these things is what kind of discount rate you use, like what time horizon you use in thinking about these things. And in general, the longer your time horizon, the more these larger scale kind of like more indirect political effects, the bigger role they're going to play in your thinking. So I at least think an organization should be explicit about okay, what time horizon are you working with and making these decisions. Uh, okay, I have three questions. Maybe. And come out and very unclear because my jet lag. Um, just first of all, reflecting on your uh, pluralism there, um, a little bit, uh, could you explain why, in what sense it's really pluralistic? Is it just like a grab bag of uh, guidelines? It can't just be that, right? And in addition, there's actually a relationship that you could establish between your four strategies. I mean, I could put them all together for you if you want. That would be great. Uh, well, but it wouldn't end up being quite so pluralistic. Which is sort of related to my second question, but very indirectly. My second question is, well, I mean, I could, if you want me to do it, the critical, you know, the critical perspective also bears, of the visual rhetoric, also bears on an understanding of the power relations in the situation. And uh, you know the uh, the drawbacks of, of uh, the first one is a little bit harder to relate, but certainly with respect to forward-looking resistance or some kind of movement, uh, you could relate them in that way. And um, you know, given the conflicts that you're aiming to resolve, your hands are being splattered, but you're going to be in ethics of resistance. So that's also I'm that issue. But anyway, but wrote. Related to that is uh, the core question, I guess, or I have two, two of them on. So this, the first of those is, um, how is this related, or why shouldn't one look at humanitarian aid organizations as verging towards solidarity movements or solidarity organizations aiming at justice? Why would one hold back from going all the way towards uh, political in the broad sense, not as one against the other, but an inclusive solidarity perspective that would aim at, you know, an egalitarian, everyone finally being able to meet their own needs kind of um, view, which I might on the face of it favor. Um, third question is, does this 
very subtle and impressive analysis have any implications for the procedures or practices that the humanitarian aid organizations, that's more intrinsic to your own analysis, that last question. Um, that's external. But does it have any implications for how they should go about comporting themselves in the sense of like procedures they should use in terms of de democratic decision making and accountability and involving members or people, the other, the other local humanitarian organizations or people they're trying to serve within their deliberations. Have you, is yeah. that part of the book too? Yeah. Um, okay, so let me take them in reverse order. So I think, um, so there's tons and tons of work now on um, responsiveness and aid recipient feedback and to the point where there's a big problem of aid recipient fatigue, right? Because they're right. like, well, partners. Or, or, or so that they've been like interviewed and like there's so many questionnaires and flash polls on their phones, right? And um, you know, in organizations, they can actually get more information than they can sometimes usefully analyze. Um, so that's a big, important sort of growth area. And I think what it suggests is, so that's sort of one point, and I'll come back to it in a minute. The other point, the thing that I talk about in my book is, I think that there's sometimes a tendency uh, sort of among some people who sort of thought about this maybe more from a distance than you have, to think, oh, so if we can't have sort of majoritarian decision-making procedures, you know, it's democratic norms are off the table. And what I talk about is there's so many other kinds of democratic norms that um, are relevant here, even if that one sort of isn't going to be feasible. So things like, um, you know, deliberation when you can, just transparency, the amount of um, there's a book called, um, oh, what's it called? It's by Carolyn Everset. It's called How They See Us, Perceptions of Humanitarian Aid. And the basic information that people do not have, like, you know, is MSF a, a, a Muslim organization? Is it a Chinese organization? You know, the, people just don't have the relevant information. So even that first step, it seems so basic, of providing people with information is like a basic sort of democratic kind of, kind of issue that I think is sort of relevant here. Um, a really hard question, right, is about um, real, real accountability to aid recipients, right? Not just like, oh, we're going to, you know, tell you stuff and we're going to create a complaints mechanism, but and this is what I was going to talk about the, with the core humanitarian standard, like something that actually involves power, right? Like, you know, citizens who vote have some kind of power, people who boycott have power, people who can, you know, press a lawsuit have power, even Amazon reviewers have power. Um, and there's sort of very little of that in the humanitarian context. People talk about accountability, but what they just mean is getting information. Um, but the question of, um, for example, you might say that um, aid recipients in a particular area should be able to keep an aid organization out, maybe. But what if that's because the aid organization is helping a minority within that um, you know, within that area that the majority doesn't like. So again, these purely majoritarian procedures aren't going to work. You have to think about democracy in sort of a richer, in sort of a richer way. But I absolutely think that sort of democratic norms apply, and all of these I try to spell out a little bit of what that would, of what that would look like. Um, but the big take-home point is, if you reduce democracy to sort of like aggregative majoritarianism, it's going to look impossible. But if you have the more expansive a view of it, um, it, it starts to look more possible. Um, uh, solidarity. Okay, so okay, right. So there's a huge um, debate in humanitarianism. It was especially sort of big in the 1990s about the relationship between humanitarianism and development, right? And um, whether there should be a continuum, whether they should sort of be all one thing. Um, and the reason why humanitarians, a lot of them, like MSF in particular, and like the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is an NGO, but is a humanitarian organization, really resisted this, is because once you're solidary, once you're engaged in a justice project, it becomes really, really hard to access aid recipients and to provide them invasive services. Because if you are seen by the, the other side as being partial, you will be murdered or kicked out of the country. Um, and so that's... No. Oh. How does the ethics of resistance then differ? Um, or I'm, I'm reading something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so, right, okay. So that so that part of why sort of a lot of humanitarians want to think of humanitarianism as its own distinct kind of project is 
Don't get scared, maybe soon get that. And uh, the resistance there is um, resistance to um, a kind of utilitarian efficiency logic. Right. So while uh, MSF refuses that logic completely by saying no, even if we're you know this is an exaggeration, even if we're just aiming 15 people and we're going to give them the very best quality healthcare, like that's a refusal to engage with the kind of like utilitarian efficiency, cost effectiveness way of thinking. Um, and I think that you know that's in some cases too extreme. That you know you, you should sort of thoughtfully be resistant and not just sort of get carried into that the way that the effective altruists are. Um, but that there's often some responsibility not to just do your, you know, what's called kind of Cadillac healthcare um, uh, in, in some of these in some of these situations. So you didn't want to post my first name. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go on. Uh, go on. Oh, oh, sort of how how pluralistic. Um, all. Oh, so I really appreciate this idea that there's sort of a critical. I think that's great, but I think that's right. That um, as a kind of um, a virtue ethics, but as sort of a description of a kind of um, orientation or attitude, that a critical orientation or attitude is a part of all of these. It's not all of it. So in um, uh, talking about spattered hands, I talk about the importance of equanimity and like not and, and just sort of like not getting bowled over by, by negative effects. So I don't think critical, if we're going to talk about sort of um, the appropriate sort of virtues in the broad sense, I don't think critical, uh, a critical orientation is, is the only one that I would point to, but I do think that it's it's an element of all of these. Um, and so um, how pluralistic, um, I don't mean anything sort of like deeply philosophical there really. Um, I, I'm more meaning to push back against the kind of effective altruist kind of you know, like monistic in the sense of qualities or life saving. Yes. So, <clears throat> from studying a little bit in the context of specific intervention, uh, these organizations, I noticed that they are very self conscious, and it seems like they're learning that, that this lesson learning practice is part of their practice, right? The aftermath of a certain emergency, they kind of sit and, and think what they did wrong and then try to make it, and they're very, they communicate with the literature and the research in this area. And, and so my sense is that your proposal will become part of this, you know, a, a policy uh, report, you know, in a policy report, it will become something of their, you know, they, they will use it in, in this way as understanding for you better understanding yourself. So my question in this regard is, first of all, is that, do you think that's going to happen? Is this something that you'd like? And also, but, but more importantly, what does it mean politically? Um, does your proposal, is your proposal creating, in a way, some kind of political reality and, and, and takes that into consideration and, and become, you know, and, and then if, if so, what quality is there a quality we're talking about here? And, and what is it? So, um, thanks. I have another question. Oh, if there's time. OK. Um, so the lessons learned, right? There's a huge industry of learning lessons and then forgetting those lessons and learning. I mean, so I think two things to be said. Like, I think you're right. Like, super big critics like Alex DeWall, right, have said that, you know, humanitarian aid is getting better in some ways, and I, and I can see that. Um, but, um, you know, if you, if you learn lessons too many times and forget them again, you start to pay more attention to the structural factors that are causing these things to happen, right? Um, and so, um, I, and, and there's whole, now there's whole book, like, Unitary's Condemned to Repeat is all about, like, you know, this sort of forgetting of lessons learned. And now we're relearning again, 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 relearning again, again, that we forget again and again. And, um, and so I think that there's things, so I think you're absolutely right that for some organizations more than others, it's very true of MSF, it's less true of some other organizations about how kind of engaged they are with, with academics and think tanks and stuff. Um, uh, but, um, so right, but 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 you know, but but I so I think things have gotten better. But I do think it's um, 
of interesting puzzle that the answer to which is probably kind of more structural or about power, about why they you know, haven't been learned more. Um, uh, you know, honestly, I would love to tell you that um, this is going to be sort of taken up, et cetera, et cetera, but aid workers are busy people, and um, a lot of aid workers on the ground are kind of at some remove from all of these kinds of, like when I think about the, you know, the aid workers who I, who I shadowed from this stuff, um, while I think and hope and um, see it seems likely given the conversation that I've had that it will be sort of taken up in some fashion, I think the honest, realistic, um, if I had to really predict what's going to happen, it's, or my hope for this, is that it's a conversation of the starter. Um, like this stuff is, is complicated, um, especially for people without the sort of, um, you know, background in, you know, political philosophy and for people who have so much more empirical information than I have that they're sort of bringing to bear, experiences that they're bringing to bear and thinking about this, um, that um, I don't really expect the full nuances of what I talk about in the book to be taken up, but I do hope that some of the main themes um, of focusing, thinking about, you know, what, it, what the ethical implications are of engaging in governance and thinking about them more systematically as second best actors and I'm thinking about, you know, acknowledging that they are political um, and that claiming to be apolitical is its own kind of politics. Um, that's the kind of stuff. And, and also some of the more kind of like, you know, institutional, narrow stuff I hope will be taken up. So like an example of something that I should talk about here, a lot of aid organizations say on the front of their webpage, we work in 60 countries or we work in 100 countries. I don't think there's any moral justification for thinking that working in more countries is better than working in fewer countries. It only prioritizes people who live in smaller countries. Um, so that's a kind of narrow claim that maybe might, you know, gain some Traction um, and I, also some of the some of the bigger stuff. So that's that's honestly what I what I think. Like I take really seriously the immense expertise and knowledge that aid workers have, um, but I've been sort of chastened about the idea that we're going to like very easily sort of run across these these boundaries. And we go. Oh, oh, sorry, but yeah, but I don't know what more time. We have a couple more people. Okay. Okay, and I'll try to be again more brief. Yeah, like we're putting it to bring her. Um, that was great. Well, so I want to ask you about when you talk about your advice for donors, it seems like that is addressed to kind of um, like masses of small donors, like people who are kind of giving without much um, of like a philanthropic strategy behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and th I think that can sort of go into directions. I think there are many donors not many, but certainly very powerful philanthropic actors who like, are extremely aware of the sort of political institutional effects that their funding has. I don't, I don't think it's a secret to Bill and Melinda Gates that they have like more GDP, you know, more yeah, yeah. to give away than the GDP of many countries in which they work. Right? So I think there's a, there's a huge awareness and to some extent an embrace of um, the political leverage that philanthropy can bring um, in these international NGOs. So on the one hand, I, I feel like more awareness of uh, ourselves as political actors, as donors, um, certainly could be welcome in situations oh, where we're giving, you know, where, where we're giving without such, um, just, uh, I guess, uh, discernment. Mm -hmm. um, and however, like, I feel like there needs to be a whole other rejoinder. I might be aligned very closely with your critique of effective altruism because I think they're very closely intertwined, the sense of, like, and this very detached analytical perspective that says like we can kind of design an intervention that like as a you know as a feature has the weight of something that's like very politically powerful behind it like that's really that to me seems like the posture of a lot of major philanthropic institutions so is there more like could we can we finesse a little bit more like what the advice is to donors and also by the way that small donors should not themselves be so embracing of these um, of the kind of data points of reassurance that I are, love that phrase. Yeah, right. Like that are the that are sort of the the the, the you know that, that are really woven into the approach of the of the mega philanthropists, right? I feel like Kiva or like is this thing where it's like yeah, my twenty five dollars is definitely going to like that ox, right? And mm -hmm. like in that place, okay. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like I want a little bit more 
you know, finesse yeah. about what the advice is to donors. Yeah. That's not so, a so okay. So to be clear, like, um, I was talking about sort of like individual people who come up to me after this talk and say, "What should I do?" Yeah. So that was um, in the book. I didn't talk that much about um, institutional found foundation donors to humanitarian aid organizations. And honestly, I honestly can tell you that I don't know how often that happens. Bill and Melinda Gates is much more kind of development yeah. stuff. Um, Emma Saunders Hastings, Rob Reich, and other people are doing a lot of really great work about the sort of anti-democratic, undemocratic, can we possibly justify them in a democratic polity um, work on, on philanthropic foundations. Um, um, so I think it's a good question to ask. It's not something that I addressed here. And I honestly don't know um, that much about, I mean, I know about corporations, but I don't know that much about the role of foundations in funding, um, you know, the big, you know, the humanitarian ideas that I'm talking about here. Um, uh, in terms of Kiva um, and global giving and organizations like that, um, I think that there's a lot of, just as um, the emergency narrative kind of just draws on sort of um, individual sort of cognitive psychology in certain kind of ways, um, so does, you know, the identifiable victim effect and all yeah. this sort of like small scale family oriented narratives and like Save the Children uses when they have a miniature of one child and Kiva uses. Um, and I think the organizations like FEMA and Global, Global Giving are also doing some really interesting and potentially questionable, well, interesting and things that we should think about in terms of how they're incentivizing both don't both people who are trying to get money or get loans on their sites and the people who are who are donating. And so that's something else that I'm, I'm working on. But I think that there's interesting stuff going on yeah. there and about the power of those algorithms and those search engines mm -hmm. um, to shape where money goes and how perceptions are shaped. Yes, um, I'm very interested. That usually, the, the the humanitarian crisis uh, start like the source of the power that starts humanitarian crisis, and left and right, be it like in uh, you know war or conflict or uh, you know economic um, uh, you know misalignment, which creates uh, you know conflict. So that's Usually, it starts from the part of the countries. And now, we have kind of like a vicious circle that the problem starts, let's say, in broad terms from a big country, and then we create the problem, and then now NGOs from those countries, they use the same situation, you know, the, 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 the same problem, to actually milk, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, taxpayers from that country, you know, and big donors too. To solve a problem, so so to me, and that creates kind of a very insidious, uh, you know, self-feeding uh, circle of uh, which is completely, completely unethical. And you see, and the way that manifests itself is that usually local, the local people, the local government are totally pushed aside, and basically, so this is like a new job creation for again. The, um, the the already uh, you know um, powerful established uh, you know societies. So, is there any way out of that? Or I, I'm not sure. If you, yeah, I mean, so when I was listing the panoply of criticisms that are you know arrayed against humanitarian NGOs, this is exactly one of them, right? They um, benefit from. You know, they, they get money from the countries that are helping to start these problems, and then they benefit from the perpetuation of these crises because they can get money to help them address them, and that's part of a part of this cycle, right? Um, so I think two things. I think the reason why most of the sort of critical books about humanitarian INGOs that I talked about at the beginning that mention exactly this and many other problems, you know, I, I think the reason why some of them at least ultimately don't come down on the let's just end this whole thing altogether is because the short term costs and harm of that to the people who are receiving aid you know is you know are are significant um, and so I totally agree with you about your critique but I'm not sure that what follows is you know Telling NGOs to sort of pack up and go home. I mean, I, I'm I am legitimately torn about this, but um, but I you know it's not something that that I could sort of 
you know, wholeheartedly endorse. I mean, I the the way out. So I, I don't know of a way out that wouldn't have like really heavy short term costs for a lot of innocent people. Um, but when I say that humanitarian INGOs are political actors and have to be sort of attentive to the consequences broadly construed of what they're doing, um, this would be an example of that. Um, so I care less about backward looking judgments about how conflicts began and more about forward looking judgments about what the effect of aid organizations either acting or not acting or acting in particular ways um, are likely to be. But it's, you know, when I said that like there's, you, there's that there's no decision that isn't morally costly, this is exactly one of the things um, that I was talking about, right? And I think, you know, one thing you can do is try to just avoid systematic bias, um, you know, um, th that discounts the kinds of things that you're talking about. Um, but in the case in Dosha, you mentioned that you mentioned grace. I think the the illusion of aid or humanitarian relief, which is an illusion to most of those uh, to, uh, to most of the immigrants, is, uh, is is the problem because that illusory promise really what led them led them to like you know go in such a harm's way to to go from somewhere to nowhere. So, and you, you think you think people are being drawn oh, yeah. to Greece because of the oh, yes, 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 yes. because because four crisis. years into the crisis, there was not such a big current. There was no. I mean, Turkey also like used them, like uses them, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, there is also the action of politicians. So, for example, when Greece changes government, I mean, it's not. You know, it, 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 you know, you can put two and two together that they announce that, oh, we're going to open the borders and basically you can use Greece as a passageway to, 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 to Europe. It's then that this, this garden was, was created. And now, of course, they are stuck and say, oh, but you told us, you know, there is a promised land and everything. Who told you that? Those NGOs. Now, who do these NGOs get their funding from? the same networks that created the problems and the, the war mongering to begin with. So, what, what, I, I don't see any ethics right here. I mean, we call it humanitarian, but actually, it's exactly the opposite. But it was Merkel who told them that they would be saved, not the NGOs. It was Merkel that told them that they would be safe? Yeah, Mer Merkel said come, and so... She didn't uh, tell them that, so, you know, but... Uh, you know. Well, they knew her policies. <laughs> Um, I think uh, so. Well, I, I, um, I think this is an opportunity as the conversation sort of um, becomes multi-directional for me to ask us all to continue the conversation at our reception on the fifth mm -hmm. floor. Um, so let's continue talking about these issues and let's thank uh, Jennifer for such a fantastic presentation. <laughs>